to the Open Source Support Briefing. Um, this is our fall update. One of the things I just want to make sure everybody's aware is we are recording this session. All right, we'll jump into it and move forward. Our core applications that we're supporting are Shibboleth, CAS, uh, Grouper, and Simple SAML, and then we'll also talk about Midpoint. Uh, one of the key things I wanted to mention with our agenda today are some special highlights and information. As we go through the events and trends, you're going to hear um, Unicom members talk about some new services that we've been working on and want you to be aware of, and we're interested in hearing your feedback. Then we're going to shift into the open source support details around each of our applications, finishing up with some information about Midpoint, which is the newest of our open source support applications. Today, uh, the people that are going to be speaking, we're going to kick it off with Mike Grady, and he's going to be focusing on um, talking about some of those trends shifting it off and then moving into Shibboleth and Simple SAML. Uh, Paul Spotty is then going to be talking about our CAS application, followed by John Gasper, who is going to be um, speaking to our grouper application. All right, so with that, we're going to go ahead and start with the events. Oh, events and trends. And um, events piece of it, I wanted to just speak about what we've got coming up this year. Not we, the community has coming up as far as conferences. So it's been a very busy year in 2018. Uh, we've seen a lot of you, which has been great to be face-to-face -face at some of the Internet 2 conferences, Educause, Aperio, et cetera. Um, that's been really nice. We wanted to make sure all of you are aware of the upcoming dates of some of the key conferences we feel are beneficial around the identity and access management um, area. So Internet2 is holding their Global Summit, which is going to be in March this year in Washington, D.C., followed by an Aperio conference in June, and then Educause in October, which is pretty usual. And then the one you should really make a special note of is the Internet2 Tech Exchange Conference for 2019 has been moved into December. So one of the things that Internet2 mm -hmm. is allowing me to speak about is they're actually looking at newcomers to identity and access management. And um, they are thinking about putting together a new conference specifically for may possibly be something this summer, but watch the community for updates. They are going to be publishing um, details if they decide to move forward with that. And I know they'll be, they'll be looking for feedback as well. So that's very, very exciting. All right, now we're going to go ahead and move on to some information about the trends. With that, I'll hand it off to Mike Grady. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so if you joined us uh, on our last webinar, a lot of these will uh, be the same as, as we would have highlighted as trends back then because they, they continue to be trends that have become mainstream. The, the use of, of multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication, uh, a risk-based uh, adaptive approaches to what type of authentication is needed, uh, the use of the OpenID Connect and uh, OAuth 2 protocols, uh, and there continues to be a lot of work in the higher ed space around <clears throat> how those protocols will uh, be best uh, used in federated type situations if and when they uh, eventually supplant SAML or at least, you know, become a, an additional protocol that you need to support well. Uh, the metadata query protocol, which uh, in common is, is in the last stages of having a production service for metadata query protocol for all of the metadata that you get today in the in common aggregate. Um, so whereas we've all needed to refrain uh, for the most part, from from use of that protocol for large aggregates like in common, uh, because there hasn't been a production service to back that, uh, that's should be coming very soon. Um, of course, moving your infrastructure and your services into the cloud, uh, mobile app and API authentication. I know it, Unicom's been involved with um, you know helping clients. Uh, have their mobile apps leverage uh, SSO and you know uh, techniques and approaches around doing that, um, and of course API authentication is is a uh, is a topic still that the Internet two tier uh, uh, effort is is uh, talking a lot about. 
Uh, and then Docker packaging. You know, the Internet 2 tier effort has now pretty much all of the components that uh, come out of their SHIB, Grouper, Co-Manage, uh, the SHIB UI that Unicon's been working on in conjunction with tier, and we'll talk about more. Uh, they're all available as uh, Docker packages uh, to, to run in, in uh, as containers. You know, move on to the next. So trends that are newish, um, uh, DevOps uh, and, you know, all of the shuns, as I put it here, continuous, you know, integration, containerization, orchestration uh, continues to grow in importance. I know Unicon's, um, you know, having an increasing number of clients looking for help for uh, setting up the processes and recipes to have, uh, uh, you know, an effective uh, pipeline from, from changes made in configuration uh, to the running containers for the production service. The uh, uh, tier, you know, I think since, uh, I think it was pretty clear that uh, at coming out of internet and tier, the the quote blessed registry provisioning components from, uh, were going to be midpoint and co-manage, but I'm not sure it was completely finalized and and stated in in uh, written in stone yet. Uh, so that is true as of uh, you know as of a number of months ago. Uh, there is a not quite ready for production, but close tier ID match component. So of course one of the uh, uh, higher ed needs that uh, differs often from from uh, what I what IAM systems need to deal with in the corporate environment is the fact that there's multiple systems of record and you need to try to decide if this if a person coming from one system of record matches up with a person from another system of record and the tier ID match component is going to be a, a, a potentially standalone component that can be integrated into whatever registry provisioning solution you have uh, to have smarts around uh, doing that kind of matching uh, and you know either decide that the same identity or, or that they're close enough that you want to kick it out for manual review uh, so that component is uh, is is in the works and is close to being uh, or reasonably close to being production ready uh, and then you know, the whole area around data privacy laws and consent continue to, uh, to surface and be of concern. And, and you know, there's, there's no uh, one solution fits all there yet, but it, it, of course, continues to be a very, an area of, of importance to us all. Now, a little bit more specifically on DevOps, and, and John, are you going to uh, talk about these next couple slides? Or? Yes, sir. Uh, so, with Internet2 uh, and their tier initiative, the uh, Trust and Identity and Re Education and Research Initiative, uh, the tier packaging committee has been uh, focused on for the last uh, year and a half, I guess, um, deploying these various applications or making these various applications available as Docker images. And at this point, there are releases of the Shibboleth IDP, the Shibboleth Service Provider, Grouper, Co-Manage, and Midpoint as Docker images. And with this new model of deploying these applications, I mean, I guess I should add that the old model is still valid. You can still download those packages, install them through the normal mechanism. Uh, but with this new model of, of deploying with Docker, uh, it makes uh, the deployment uh, much faster and consistent. Uh, using Grouper as an example, um, Grouper, you know, they, they produce new releases every year or so. And then at that point, you know, you're kind of, there's a, a patching um, lack of a schedule, but it's kind of as patches comes out, you can decide when to apply those specific patches and making sure that your environments are consistent uh, across um, uh, nodes in a specific environment and that the uh, patches are, are, have, you know, moved up in an incremental fashion properly from like say a test to QA to production uh, can be a little difficult to achieve. With Docker, uh, the installation and uh, deployment of specific patch sets are, is very, very easy. It's just a, a matter of switching a, a tag name of the running Docker container, uh, and those patches are magically applied to your environment. So with that, a lot of folks are now looking at, well, how can we best support our Dockerized environments? 
Uh, so that brings up the topic of orchestration. How do we keep the running containers running? And uh, that allows us to use uh, technologies like Docker Swarm, which is the tier supported orchestration choice. Um, you can use Kubernetes, you can use other uh, OpenShift and different things out there, but tier is the one, or tier has chosen to support uh, Docker Swarm. And with Swarm, it's, it's actually kind of a cool technology. You can just spin up new instances of hardware, attach them to a Swarm with a single command line, and uh, applications will deploy um, out to those, uh, those systems um, as you scale up and scale down your, um, the number of uh, running instances of, say, the Grouper UI or the SHIB IDP. Uh, Co-manage and Midpoint uh, can do the same thing as well. Um, so now that we're able to run these different applications, uh, scale them up, scale them down, um, you know, how do we go through and, and deploy changes to those applications to the configurations running under those Dockerized applications? And we can use uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment techniques that have been used for um, probably, I, it's started gaining popularity, I'd say about 10 years ago. Uh, Jenkins is an application that many clients use for CI/CD. It's a Java-based uh, open source application. And... Uh, it, it makes um, the whole flow and pipelining the whole flow of, hey, we're going to make a configuration change um, and then getting that change moved all the way into, uh, theoretically, into a production system. Um, it makes it uh, very easy to do. Now, as, as I kind of talk through and as I show you, um, I think it's the next slide that has kind of a, has a flow chart of this. Um, everything in this model is, is technically pluggable, it's changeable. So if in your environment Jenkins isn't um, necessarily what you want to do, that's fine. You could swap it out for a, a cloud provider um, specific solution. For example, AWS, you could use Code Pipeline or Code Build uh, to do uh, some of this work. Uh, thank you. So starting, um, this is basically the flow chart of how uh, the DevOps pipeline kind of works. Um, you have an admin or a dev that makes a change. It could be uh, an internal configuration change. It could be uh, updating an image or some CSS. Uh, you know, it really doesn't matter, but you're making a change to a source code uh, repository, uh, for example, Git. And that commit uh, gets pushed into whatever the backend storage uh, system is. Uh, the Git repo is going to kick off a webhook. Uh, it could also be a poll a pull request where Jenkins, in this case, is looking for changes from uh, the Git repo. Uh, but at any sense, um, Jenkins is going to kick off a new build. And so on a, a, a Docker worker node, it's going to pull down those source changes um, and the pipeline is going to get kicked off and we're going to build that Docker image. Um, from, that stand, uh, from there, we look at the Docker image. Did the build complete? If it did, uh, we can move on into this optional, um, the red uh, boxed area, which allows us to run tests against that image. Just these are sanity uh, tests, um, or as I often call them, a red green test. We're just going to, you know, run against a uh, a static um, directory LDAP. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a database. Um, you know, it's basically we're testing with consistent data, making sure that everything's working the way that we expect it to. At that point, we can publish our image to a Docker uh, registry, a repository for those images. And then at that point, we tell um, the uh, requested, uh, we request the Docker Swarm to do an update of the, of the image running the various containers that are deployed um, of the, the service. And at that point, Swarm is gonna say, oh, we need to, um, and it'll do it in a rolling fashion. We need to start up a new container using the new image, uh, and then it will uh, shut down the old containers running uh, the old image. And at that point, we can run the second uh, red boxed area, uh, the blue-green test, where we are able to run real-world tests against, it was say, the SHIB IDP. We could hit all of the service provider integrations using a testing framework to go through and make sure that nothing um, has broke uh, using this new image, again, using our real-world um, testing. At that point, if there was a failure, it's not uh, shown here, but we actually could instruct Swarm to actually roll back uh, to the previous uh, service definition, which would have included 
that older container um, and Docker image. Uh, so it would um, uh, shut down our, our new uh, containers and spin up the old uh, containers that um, had been uh, essentially put to sleep. Uh, but if, this, if everything was successful in our testing, then it deploys everything um, and, and allows everything to stay running. And then the Jenkins job is, is marked as successful. So that's basically what a DevOps pipeline is looking like. And if I can have you advance, um, we'll talk about some of the, uh, the work that we've actually done with clients uh, making this happen. Um, so we have worked with clients to, def to deploy uh, the Shibboleth IDP and Grouper uh, via Docker Swarm. And we've actually done work now with uh, Kubernetes as well, which again is another orchestration technology. That specific one, uh, Kubernetes, is based on um, open source code that Google started and, and has run their infrastructure on uh, for years. And now it's available for um, everyone to use if, if you want to. Uh, Swarm is a good starting place, I, I would argue, uh, to work with, to get familiar with uh, general concepts. And then as you are looking to, uh, to move maybe to something a little more enterprise ready, fully capable with lots of bells and whistles, then Kubernetes is definitely something to look at. Um, the environments that we've helped clients work with, uh, we have, um, as far as this DevOps stuff goes, uh, on-prem obviously is, uh, is still very popular, but more folks are looking at uh, moving in, into AWS especially as they transition to cloud, it kind of makes sense to look at this uh, containerization um, in, in AWS. And we've also done some work now with uh, the Google Cloud platform. We have a client that's uh, running there, and uh, so we are using, uh, we're able to, to help them get uh, uh, Shibboleth IDP running under uh, Kubernetes um, there. Now for all of these deployments, uh, Jenkins has been used, uh, but uh, Code Pipeline and some of the other ones are definitely usable. Um, I'm actually looking at a project right now where we'll be using code build uh, to move along uh, some of this, uh, these components that are going to fit into um, a smaller portion of our full DevOps pipeline. Uh, so it's, again, it is all plug and playable. So if this is uh, something you're kind of interested in and you need kind of a, a push to get going, um, Unicon would certainly love to help you. In fact, I just talked to a client this morning about uh, doing an on-site training where we're going to do a, a day and a half long uh, doctor training. Um, and if, uh, if you're going to attend TechX next fall, I suspect uh, that we, I will be giving the uh, doctor uh, training class uh, there again that I've done the last two years. Uh, so either way, uh, you can get more information about uh, all of these fun, uh, exciting new uh, uh, way of deploying identity and access management uh, software. Excellent. Thank you, John. All right. With that said, uh, we're going to go ahead and shift over and hear about Shibboleth. Mike? Hi. So Shibboleth, the IDP and the SP have uh, relatively, well, very recently in the case of the IDP, not quite as recently in the case of the SP, um, have uh, new releases. Uh, the SP in particular went from uh, version 2 to version 3, so more significant changes. Uh, the IDP, um, it, the latest version is now 3.4.1. And then, of course, as uh, any of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the same thing remains true in terms of the core SHIB team, the SHIB consortium, is that, you know, uh, from their perspective, the only supported release is the latest release. Of course, Unicon continues to help clients, uh, you know, as well as we can with whatever release that they are running of the software. Um, you can move to the SHIB SP or the, the latest version of the IDP with, with almost no uh, changes in any of your configuration files. I don't think anything in the IDP would be required. Uh, the SP, there might be a few small things, but, but essentially the configuration files for the SP uh, that you would have had with version 2 will work with version 3. It's just that some of the new capabilities and features, uh, you may want to make changes uh, to take advantage of them. Um, and to say, there are some interesting new features with both, which we'll now talk about. Move on to the next. Uh, so with the IDP, uh, there's a number of things, and you can look at, as a note in the, uh, the bottom right, um, quadrant of this slide that you know the the release notes 
are always the right place to go to to find the full set of changes from one release of SHIB to the next. Uh, but in particular, I wanted to highlight uh, three, uh, three things, metadata-driven configuration. So at our uh, last session, and at uh, several of the, you know, the, the Internet2 uh, TechX that was uh, just held in October, the Global Summit earlier this year, and if, um, we've, we've talked about a Shibboleth UI that, that Unicon and Internet2 have been jointly funding the work on creating, which was specifically crafted to take advantage of this new metadata-driven configuration support that comes with IDP 3.4, uh, where the, the key thing is that one can add um, entity attribute tags into the metadata for, for different SPs, and that can drive relying party override. So instead of having to go into the relying party file and say turn off encryption or use SHA-1 or uh, any number of think reasons that you might have needed to do a relying party override, you can leave relying party alone and get uh, trigger all of that behavior by embedding these entity attribute tags. Uh, and there's a, you know, a, a defined set of them that comes with the SHIB IDP. The SHIB UI makes it easy to leverage and manage those without really having to learn the specific syntax that you would need to embed those, to, you know, to, to, cr to craft those tags to embed in the metadata. Um, there's, there are more places now where you can use scripts, inline scripts, rather than having to find beans. So if you need to put in various types of activation conditions and other controls, uh, you can uh, do that in more places now with an inline script rather than having to worry about crafting a bean and then referencing it. Um, one, one particular thing it is, is they've also added more attributes to control what configuration fires. So if you've had the need in the past in your um, uh, attribute resolver to create, to encode an attribute with a name specific to a given SP, because this, this service requires that you send the name instead of with the OID URN for given name or surname, you're supposed to send it with the name of first name. Um, you can now uh, just add a relying party attribute into an encoder so that you can, you know, rather than having to create second definitions of those attributes just to have a different encoder to encode in a different name, you can have all the encoders you want in the single attribute definition and just have those encoders be specific to a particular relying party. And you can embed that as an attribute value right in the encoder. The other thing is the SHIB team is preparing for the next major release of the IDP, which I don't think, uh, I haven't seen anything. I, you know, I would assume sometime in calendar year 2019, but I haven't seen any specific about an expected release date for that. But what they've done with version 3.4 of the IDP is they've embedded a lot of warning messages for any configuration that you're using in your three version three IDP uh, that's expected to not exist anymore in V4. So configuration that if you were to look in the SHIB wiki is, is shown as being deprecated, you will now notice when you go to 3.4, you're probably gonna see a lot more warning or you potentially could see a lot more warning messages in your logs that says, hey, by the way, the way you have this configured right now will not you know, will not be the way you do it in version four. Um, so gives you that advanced warning and time that you could go in and adjust those config files to, to um, you know, three, four would now have a different way to configure it that would match up with the way they're planning in V4. Um, and you could start addressing that sooner than later. As I say, you can go to the release notes uh, to see other things that are embedded in there. There's, there's support now for Duo with the ECP flow. Uh, you can now configure CAS, the use of CAS, rather than uh, having the service registry-like CAS protocol file that you configure. Uh, there is a 
like SAML metadata approach that you can now use to configure um, uh, what services that you, uh, your CAS endpoints are supposed to support. Uh, there's enhanced and better interceptors, more flexibility in, in uh, having a single interceptor that can enforce multiple authorization rules. Uh, there's now a, a, a data connector for HTTP. So if you need to uh, call out to a web service to bring in an attribute for the IDP. So uh, a, a number of improvements available in 3.4. So if you want to, uh, and now for the SP, uh, the, you know, the most basic thing is that version three of the SP redid some of the underlying architecture so it's easier to move forward with new features um, and, and have the, the support in the SP move along and advance uh, in conjunction with the types of features that are available in the IDP. So the, the basic architecture change is probably the biggest thing, um, but uh, some key highlights is that if you use the SP with IIS, um, there's much better support for IIS 7 rather than having to put in, uh, I think, the old IIS 6 compatibility library. Um, you don't have to do that anymore. Plus, there's a more secure way to be able to pass information into an application protected in IIS through server variables rather than needing to do it through HTTP headers like has been the case before. And there's support for actually populating a remote user uh, variable and you can preserve post data if you you can turn that on too if you if you need to uh, before sending the user off to the IDP for authentication uh, there's a capability of stateless clustering so the SP now supports a client-side encrypted cookie that can keep SP state there are some limitations there are certain things around logout and, and you know use of some other features in the SP where the encrypt, just like on the IDP, where the encrypted client side cookie can't do everything you need, but it certainly can, uh, for a number of use cases, simplify what you need to do if, if you need to cluster um, uh, the SP. It also has simpler vhost support. Um, you can set it up to auto assign distinct entity IDs and, and avoid having to go into the application override configuration. And again, there's you know any number of other features that are there now um, uh, there's some Im improvements in how the sp can support you doing dynamic metadata with mdq there's an admin logout capability where you can go in and end a user session um, there's some default like uh, the, the default of using sha sha1 versus sha256 has changed so there's a number of other changes um, that are there and again consult the release notes to to see a detailed list So a little bit more on the Shibleth UI uh, Unicon has been working with uh, uh, Internet to a tier to uh, craft a, a Shibleth UI and to continue to expand its feature set um, and the number of things that you can control through it uh, and there is sort of the first sort of official release of it that's out available in the Internet to um, uh, code repository and including Docker containers. Uh, the basic idea is with the Shibboleth UI, you can either, uh, once you go on to the next uh, slide, you can add individual SPs. You can, you can control the metadata for your point-to-point -point integrations where the, you either need to craft the metadata yourself because the service can't give you a metadata file, or they give you a metadata file, but you're going to be manually managing it. You would have you know, before stuck it in a, in a file in your metadata directory and then had to update your metadata provider file to reference it. Uh, the UI assists with doing all of that. Uh, the, U of I, the UI allows you to define um, uh, file-backed metadata providers like the Incommon Aggregate. Um, it allows you to, to take advantage of all of these capabilities in IDP 3.4 for controlling relying party uh, features uh, uh, by embedding these entity tags, whether you're doing that directly in an individual metadata file 
or whether if you're consuming something like the in common aggregate, you can't embed the tags in the individual file because you don't control the individual file. You're, you know, that's coming from in common, but you can annotate what you get from in common with what are called metadata filters. And the SHIB UI does that all for you and generates the XML in the end that you need. And you don't need to learn the details of how to do that yourself. Um, and, and there's a capability to control attribute release. If, again, if you have a, an attribute filter with the right features in it, uh, you could use the UI to say, hey, the, these are the attributes uh, rules that I want to be triggered to release these attributes to this SP. So all of those are capabilities in the SHIB UI today, and work continues on the SHIB UI to add an increasing number of features. We we'll go on to the next slide, and uh, so the bulk of the sustaining engineering work that Unicon's been doing around Shibleth has has been with the Shibleth UI, uh, Unicon's contributions to that effort. Uh, but we do also continue to maintain the Unicon uh, plugins for the Shibleth IDP, the the Hazelcast support, the the Shibcas three uh, Authn three uh, hook to 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 layer Shib over Cas. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, there's another one I'm not thinking of at the moment. Um, and then we're also doing some work around reporting and statistics uh, that we hope to make it into the SHIB UI uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, so we are doing some uh, other sustaining engineering efforts, but say the bulk, the bulk of the, the, uh, the resources for that have, have gone into the work on the SHIB with UI. You want to move on and excellent. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. All right, we're now going to shift over to Paul, and he's going to talk to us about CAS and move through through things quite swiftly. All Thank right. you. Hi, this is Paul. So the current release of CAS is 5.3, um, and the, it actually is 5.35. 5.36 is coming. Uh, basically, that is is uh, easy upgrade from 5.2, 5.1, 5.0, and a 5 version. Um, CAS 6 is in development. That's a, a major release, and that'll be a, a larger update a new overlay and all that kind of stuff. Uh, pre 5.3 releases from the community standpoint are end of life. Uh, what that means is 5.2 series, for example, uh, will not receive new features. It'll just receive security patches until November 27, 2019. Uh, Unicon, of course, will support you uh, at any CAS version as best we can. Next slide. Uh, so we have some highlights for 5.3 that release some major features. Uh, there's service replication via Hazelcast. What this means is that you can um, actually store uh, your service files, your JSON or YAML service files, via Hazelcast and distribute them. Uh, you don't have to worry about keeping files locally and all that kind of stuff. Uh, dynamic metadata management. Um, this is, goes to what Mike kind of discussed with the MQP. Um, so that protocol is supported. Um, you can uh, have metadata stored in Mongo, SQL, Groovy, S3, Amazon, um, you know, and of course using REST in, in addition to the URL and file that are already there. Uh, externalized views, um, what that means is that the CAS UI part, uh, templating, dime leaf, that kind of stuff, can be external outside of the repository, that way you don't have to always build CAS. Uh, while this was true in the past, um, it's much easier to implement now and work with uh, externally of your repository and building the war. Um, SAML2 attribute friendly names. Uh, what that means is you can individually define friendly names separate from the actual attribute name um, in the SAML2 response uh, assertion. And what that, what that does, before you cannot change them, they're the same. And now this allows you to change them. Perhaps you have an SP that needs it a certain way. And now you can do that. Uh, password, passwordless authentication. Uh, what that means is uh, you can uh, log in with tokens uh, that would usually expire and they're sent via text or phone or email and that kind of stuff. And you don't have to use a password to log in. So you, you, know, you enter your credentials, you get an email, for example, um, you have a token, you enter that token, and now you can be SSO'd in. Uh, the custom CAS settings. Um, before, you have to write Java with configuration to add any sort of custom configuration to CAS. Uh, now, there is a custom property and you can just extend off of that and it'll load those properties into you. Um, also, all the properties are available to all the login pages and Webflow. 
So what that means is these custom properties, for example, and all other properties you, know, you put into CASA properties are available like on the login page, for example, or any other page you might want to customize before that wasn't the case. And then uh, Google Authenticator, so that's an app, you know, typically on your phone, and what you do is, is it has a code, you know, just like we're talking about with the token or passwordless authentication, it has a code, and that you use for MFA. So now we support Google Authenticator, so you don't have to use, like, Duo or anything like that, you can just use this app on your phone, get the code from there, uh, once you sync it, and then you enter that code in for your, your second factor. Next slide, please. So CAS 6 is in development. Um, it's in the release candidate stage right now. What that means is, um, you know, if you want to use it in production, you probably should put it in dev and test and let it soak for a bit first, but it is in release candidate. It does support Java 11 LTS, and there's, a lot of been, there's been a lot of questions about Oracle's release strategy. They've switched to a, a rapid release strategy for Java, and it'll work perfectly with CAS. Um, uh, currently, Java 8 is supported until December 2020 through OpenJDK. Commercial, if you pay Oracle for the license, is January 2019. That's for Java 8. Java 11 is the new long-term support. Um, it's looking like 2023 or something. I don't think it's all been set in stone exactly. Um, and that is available only through like OpenJDK or other derivatives thereof. Um, and so CAS 6 supports that. Uh, there's quite a bit of framework and, and feature upgrade or you know boot upgrades as you see here to support that. Um, so that, that's why it's only on Java 6 at this point that supports Java 11, or CAS 6 Java 11. Um, Spring 5X and Spring Boot 2X are, the, are two big library changes to CAS and 6. Um, there's a lot of under the hood stuff for us developers, uh, but there's actually several features such as uh, the endpoints we'll talk about in a, in a little bit and some configuration changes that make it a little bit easier and nicer to work with. So good things for everyone there. Uh, the actual endpoints um, are actually referring to the admin endpoints. In previously in CAS 5.2, 5.3, and before, you had a dashboard. That dashboard has been removed, and there's actual endpoints. They've been actually streamlined with Spring Boot. The security, you can actually apply individually to each URL, um, which has been a highly requested feature. Um, and besides that, um, it, it kind of streamlines CAS and it can provide the information via REST or whatever you want to do with those endpoints and makes it easier. Uh, the hope is in the future or is that um, the dashboard type functionality will move into the CAS management web application um, where everything kind of service and, and management applicated, you know, things will, will be stored. Uh, the next thing is Webflow decorations and uh, decorators, you know, as they're called. And basically what you can do here is add in data, um, typically from REST or other things, into the web flow. You've been able to code up an HTML JavaScript or something, but you need to get data from somewhere, say a remote endpoint in your own system. The decorators allow you to do that without writing Java, uh, just Groovy, uh, Groovy script. Authentication source selection. Um, this allows the user to choose which, say you have several authenticator, authentic authentications like LDAP, database, perhaps delegated, right? Delegate to, to a SHIB IDP, who knows, right? Um, you have several of these, and the user can actually decide which one they want to use. You can also now, uh, based on the on user credentials predicate, say like an email domain or something, uh, you can actually have them automatically go to one uh, authentication source. Another really neat feature is SAML2 IDP single logout. Previously, CAS supported single logout in that it just redirected back to the logout page in CAS. It did not actually send the, the single logout command back to the SP. Now it supports that in CAS 6, and uh, we'll, uh, you know, there'll be more features and, th and things that are coming, but right now it supports a basic single logout scenario uh, in SAML 2. Registered service environments, uh, what, that, what that means is in your service JSON or YAML or whatever you prefer to use, you can actually specify an environment that that service should be used in, say test production or dev test. And then you can use the Spring Boot environment um, command. So when you start up your, your CAS server, you can actually tell it what environment it is. And via that, you, certain services will work in, in like prod, for example, and not in dev or vice versa. That way you don't have to maintain separate files or separate configurations and can streamline configuration for you. Right, next slide. Uh, so the sustaining engineering work really went into this new CAS 6 development, uh, 5.3 updates. And the CAS um, client uh, you know, portion was released to 2.10, which is the client side of CAS, not the CAS server, but the CAS client. 
was recently upgraded as well. Um, if there's any questions on the Oracle Java changes, on CAS updates or versioning or differences, you know, as, feel free to contact Unicon and we're happy to assist. Um, also keep in mind there's many more features I didn't cover here. I mean, 6 has a lot in it. Uh, 5.3 5 has quite a bit. So if you, if you have any questions on new features or anything like that, do check out the, the blog. I'll put a, a link in the chat shortly. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. All right, next we move on and introduce John, who's going to talk about Grouper. All right. Uh, I don't have a lot to talk about, um, but some of the highlights are that uh, Grouper 2.4 is out. Um, it took, I think, a year and a half for it to, to get you know, formally released. And uh, they are planning on uh, shortening that uh, cycle for Grouper 2.5, which they're still planning as of uh, last month to, uh, to release uh, in 2019 in the spring. Uh, so just some uh, quick 2.4 highlights that were talked about at uh, Tech Exchange uh, in Orlando uh, last month. Uh, Grouper has user deprovisioning, uh, de which allows uh, specified admins uh, to go through and quickly remove um, users from provision systems. So before, if you had an employee that you needed to, to you know, terminate from the system and you needed to do it kind of post haste, you kind of had to reach out uh, to various people and have them, you know, if, if they had administrative um, abilities over specific uh, branches or, or parts of the tree, um, you, you'd have to go through and maybe talk to different people and have them remove it. And now that's all been kind of centralized through one management console, um, and uh, and the deprovisioning can be triggered uh, through the UI. Uh, one thing that uh, is also kind of cool is if there is a one-way, um, meaning it's write only, and we don't have the ability to necessarily deprovision the user through whatever the provisioning agent is, uh, Grouper will you know bubble up and tell you, hey, this is a read-only, and uh, let you know um, so you can you know go and, and manually remove it from that downstream system. Uh, Grouper templates give you the ability to build out uh, folders in a consistent uh, man, uh, 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 mechanism. So basically the idea is that if you're, let's say you're starting up a new application and a lot of times, especially if you're following like the tier deployment guide for a Grouper, uh, you'll, you'll build out the application folder structure in a very specific way with uh, management groups and, and other uh, permissions set up in there. With these templates, uh, you basically provide some information uh, through the UI, through the Grouper shell, run the, uh, run the templating process, and it'll expand that all out into a nice, beautiful structure. So out of the box, it comes with two templates, uh, and you can certainly uh, add your own uh, templates uh, to the mix. I'm kind of going back to that DevOps and uh, tier packaging uh, conversation. Uh, the old uh, VM uh, appliance out there that uh, tier put together, uh, it's probably three years ago now, um, that's essentially deprecated. I think you still can pull it down, uh, but running the Docker images is the uh, preferred way and just running it in whatever mechanism you want to. Again, Docker Swarm being the preferred uh, orchestration uh, technology for that. Uh, so you can build those images from source, or you can use the pre-built um, uh, tier grouper images. And uh, some grouper cleanup after uh, many years, the admin and light UIs have been removed uh, from the grouper UI. So the grouper new UI is no longer new, it's just the grouper UI. Uh, but if you do need to, rest or if you do need those old admin and light UIs, uh, if there's some functionality that still isn't quite there, uh, if it hasn't been ported, you can restore the admin and light UI uh, back into the Grouper UI. As far as Unicon and some of our clients' uh, contributions uh, to the uh, Grouper community, uh, Columbia University uh, in the last um, uh, several months had provide, has provided some uh, I guess assistance uh, time for Unicon to make some changes to the Google provisioner. So if you are a user of that Google provisioner, you may want to go grab the latest uh, version. There are some uh, bug fixes uh, that, uh, that were done for that. Uh, and Unicon through our open source support uh, program as well as University of Nebraska and Colorado School of Mines contribution, we have been still uh, working on um, that, uh, the tier Docker image. Uh, work on that has kind of slowed down now. It's a little more stable, 
but uh, much of that uh, work was actually sponsored by our clients uh, and our OSS clients. And uh, finally, uh, Unicon, uh, along with Internet2, we worked on a grouper training environment uh, that was used at Tech Exchange. Uh, that environment is available for people if you want to uh, go uh, kind of walk through uh, exercises. I believe they're working on making uh, videos of that uh, available as well. Uh, so you can kind of get some experience uh, deploying grouper and uh, playing around with some of the configurations um, and other mechanisms that are outlined in the tier sponsored grouper deployment guide. Excellent. Thanks, John. Uh, with that, we're going to hand it over to Mike, who's going to take you through the highlights of Simple SAML PHP. Yeah, just uh, don't have much here on Simple SAML PHP. Just want to note that the latest version is now 1.16.2. And to very much emphasize, if you're running Simple SAML PHP, you should not be running a version less than 1.15. Dot four, certainly not less than 115.3, because before that there was very, uh, very serious uh, security uh, uh, issue uh, with any older versions of it. Um, the Simple SAML continues to make a variety of incremental improvements to the code base, and to say again to highlight, uh, it's you can use it as your IDP, you can use it as your SP, or in, in say the bulk of Unicon's involvement with it with clients has been to use it as an IDP proxy. Uh, you wanna move on to the next slide. Uh, this highlights some of the changes that continue, those incremental changes that continue to be made in Simple SAML. There's now uh, ECP support um, as the SHIB IDP has had, but now it's now also in Simple SAML. Uh, they're continuing to improve the handling of XML metadata. Um, they've changed how it, it one of the simple SAML like uh, CAS5 and like sh the SHIB IDP can support multiple protocols. It, it's had a capability, a light capability to be a CAS server. They're uh, changing how that's supported in simple SAML as it's now a separate module that's added in rather than what was included. Uh, they're, as other uh, SAML implementations have done, they're, they're changing what some of the defaults are. Now the default is SHA-256 rather than SHA-1 for signing. Uh, they continue to improve the documentation and they've been focused on improving the underlying code quality and style. They're moving to using Twig templates for the theming of Simple SAML and the UI uh, aspects. Uh, and Simple SAML version two is in the works. Uh, so don't know anything about when that's coming out, but that will be the next major version of Simple SAML. Excellent, thank you, Mike. All right, with that said, we're gonna quickly move into uh, Midpoint um, just to share the news here, and then we'll open for any questions. So we're very, very excited to mention that we have added Midpoint as our newest open source support offering. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, it's in summary, it is a governance registry and provisioning tool, which actually does a lot more. For many out in the open source world, um, this fills a gap, right? It helps put together some, with some of the other open source applications to make a real full IAM offering. We're happy to answer any questions um, that you have around that. There's a lot out there that's linked to the Unicon site, um, as well as um, if you join support, we can even help in more detail. So just as a reminder, some of the things that we do within support is not just to answer questions, provide guidance, and help you bring resolution to anything you have issues on, but we also have an option within our support program to have consulting executed. So we can help with midpoint connectors, we can help with any possible issues, or maybe the start of some enhancements within the midpoint application. So if you're interested in that, please reach out directly to me and I'll be happy to share all the details around adding Midpoint on as one of your open source support applications. Uh, let's see, the other thing I wanted to mention, you've heard uh, several times about the Internet 2 tier bundle. Midpoint is part of that package bundle that is out there um, within the repository. And uh, with that, I think um, I'm gonna open it up for any questions or comments that we do have. A lot of information was covered, so I know, I know there's a lot to sink in. Um, please go ahead and add something in chat or go ahead and, and directly speak out. This is also a great time to ask each other specific questions. If you're somebody that's looking to maybe, um, you know, 
start up with a new release of CAS or SHIV or maybe have questions about DevOps or, or Grouper, um, ask other, um, other peers here on the call, that's great. We also have obviously a team of technical experts from Unicon that can also guide you if you've got any questions on these specific topics that we've mentioned. So it's all fair game here. We've got a couple minutes and would definitely like to share some additional information if you have specific questions. How about any feedback on the discussion today um, as far as the variety of topics and the highlights that were shared? Is there any feedback that we can gather on that? I would just like to ask and feel free to do it through chat. You know, how many folks have actually looked at running their IAM infrastructure on Docker? Okay, we've got one running CAS 3.5 and 5.3 on Docker. Excellent. Thank you, Eric, for sharing. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Eric, can I just have you share, are you uh, using uh, Docker straight out or are you using Docker Swarm or Kubernetes for, or something else for orchestration? Okay, so you're using ECS and a deployment pipeline. Perfect. Thank you. We have a quiet group today. Any final comments or questions you have for the team or for each other before we wrap up today? All right, with that said, I think we'll go ahead and um, wrap up this meeting. Thank you all for joining, and we hope you found great value in the presentation. Have a happy Thanksgiving. You too, thanks.